Welcome everyone, I'm Vicente Cruz, Oakland Greens uh, Treasurer, Event and Fundraising Coordinator. And we are here at our monthly virtual town hall series. And this one is our second annual on education. Uh, we try to do education, alternative politics, alternative political parties even, and also uh, linguistics, what we say, how we say it, what we mean uh, annually inside of our virtual town hall series. Um, so this one for education, we are actually going to be talking about policy and I will be starting it off a little bit different as I'm actually going to give you some things that we discuss and what we would like to see in, as an alternative education system all around. And, um, and then I'm going to not be too long and get brief and then also talk about how uh, we would pay for it and what we would pay. And that's where I will start is that we believe in the Green Party itself. Um, and you won't hear me say that all too often. Um, not, of course, I really am a believer in alternative politics and would love for everyone to register green and get out of the two-party system, aside from the fact that not only uh, the Oakland Greens, but myself also believe what has the two-party system done for us, right? We're still getting, you know, as far as people of color now, still getting killed every day. There's still plantation prison system and things like that. But, uh, so, but we believe that everyone all of the, so a lot of the ills would go away if everyone had a living wage and could actually take care of themselves, have a basic standard of living. Uh, I personally also believe that we could keep that basic standard of living even to the standard that we have here as far as people having computers, access to internet, um, artist content through other uh, video media and social media. I think we could maintain that for all and still be sustainable to the planet and not have the planet be done with us as it seems to be as the heat waves and other extreme weathers take over. Uh, so I would start out by saying that our lowest paid employee again would be living wages. So I wouldn't start, fight for 15 doesn't even thrill me. I mean, we're here in California. Uh, I think $25 an hour would be a bare minimum. And even that is a squeak by. Um, I also base that on uh, that it would be my, I'm in event production as a profession and that's the lowest rate I would ever take if it was a struggling company or something that needed uh, a pay cut. I can't do it for less than 25. So we would start out that way too. Also believing that there's a dead prez song that says that just because I didn't graduate high school doesn't mean I couldn't be a doctor or a dentist. Uh, there are people who have natural skills. If you've ever read the autobiography of Malcolm X, he talks about West Indian Archie and how he kept all the numbers in his head, probably could have been work for NASA, but instead all he had was the streets. So I believe in just finding the best people that could do it. Also, I want to, I am a youth sports educator. Um, I did it for all of my kids and also inside of the Oakland OSUD system for four years and all of the 85 kids that I worked through. And, and when I use sports education, I talk about from a Juan Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, and uh, Mr. Newman, the uh, racer from Australia aspect of taking a social justice approach. I did that through all the sports leagues. I ran YMCA and Pleasant Hill and all that. And we could do some of those things here. So not just doing that. So having living wages, hiring the best people for the job that may not, you may have want to train them, but may not have the credentials that the state says. That's another one that always triggers me also. It's like, if we all agree that our education system's fucked up, but yet that is the criteria we're using for who we're judging is gonna educate. Well, actually they just say teach the kids. And I don't like that. I wanna educate uh, rather than just teach. So uh, I would think that on that one too, you're, you would, uh, how you would also pay for those uh, higher wages is, of course, like we even say, again, is taxing people who can't afford it, right? I don't know why the people who couldn't afford the taxes to pay for these things get all up in arms about, no, don't raise my taxes. Well, really, your taxes aren't going up. You don't have the money to pay for it anyway, so it's not going to affect you, but it is going to affect Bezos and all these other fools that are paying to go to space while we can't even take care of what's here. So living wages on that and you use it. Uh, for that and then actual education systems. So when I say uh, bringing home ec back into schools, I don't just mean that as uh, cooking, which I love that in school because I'm a big old foodie and I love cake. So I loved being able to bake inside of home ec, but also how to do a job interview, how to uh, hygiene for yourself. I don't know if we, I'm, 
I have any other educators here who've educated at the elementary school and middle school level, but sometimes kids can be a little funky. Right? Boy, if you got kids your own, can't get them to take baths. So uh, having those approach, auto shop, welding, woodwork, uh, electrical. So how to change a tire. I actually was uh, on the road and saw, well, you call them AAA because no one knew how to change the tire themselves. Like, I think that is a, that's a travesty. We should be able to do those things. Um, so having that, and then on my tip two, arts, sports, and arts, of course, including not just painting, but music, acting. Again, my uh, expertise is in lighting design. And um, so uh, I think that there are, there's tons more technical jobs inside of entertainment than there are acting jobs. Everybody wants, well, most people, it seems, still want that celebrity skin. Uh, I'm not for that. There's actually way more work behind the scenes. And some of those actually get paid more money than the actors. Um, and also, if nothing else, doing well enough and still being able to keep anonymity where you can go to the store by yourself and don't have to be locked away like some big celebrity. So having all of those things and how we pay for it. So those are the ideas that I have. And I would like to open it up to other people here, comments on what I've said wanting to deep dive and expand on them. Does anyone have any thoughts on what type of education system they would want for our children, not just here in Oakland, but nationally, anyone? Orlando, Senator, please, go ahead. I, I have two guesses on here. I have one is Lawrence, and I also have another one, Brother Sunja. They both got good programs. <clears throat> They're great, active in the community. I believe they can bring a lot to, to the Greens, also, especially when it comes to people of color and understanding the racial growth program, but these are two people that I really support and do endorse, but they could bring a lot to the dialogue. I just want to add that on. Anyone can speak. Well, hey. Well, how y'all doing? I, hey, uh, he could go first, matter. Okay. No, no, yes. I'll let you go, because I'm driving and I can listen. Oh, okay. Far. All right, Hello. well. I'm a, I'm a long, long time friend of Orlando, uh, probably about 15, 17, 20 years probably going on now. <laughs> so um, I am a, 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 a witness, and I can say now victim of the, of the education system because, um, you know, I've just seen the change. And I, I noticed that I heard you say about the home ec. Um, in schools. When I was in school, that was like a class that had to be taken. We didn't even have a choice when we was in elementary school. But in, it, you know, in that school, um, we learned how to make applesauce. We learned how to budget uh, credit cards. We learned a whole bunch of stuff. And it was amazing that our teacher was Asian, Miss Chan. And she taught us so much in home ec. And it was like, a class that everybody just loved to be in because we were learning life skills. And it seems that that's no longer um, in, in the school system. Um, I have two daughters that were attending, I saw a change, that were attending Manzanita Elementary School. And I saw that they were trying to implement some of that, infer, some of that, that home economic stuff back into the kids. But once my kids kind of graduated and went on to junior high school, you know, I kind of lost focus of what was going on in the elementary school system. But just growing up in Oakland, long story short, um, I just love the Bay Area and I love helping with media, taking for uh, taking pictures. Now I'm flying drones and things of like that. So I love to bring awareness to to what everybody is doing. Um, Orlando has been talking to me about the Green Party for I can say about what man about five years. <laughs> It's been about five years when he first introduced me to it. And he was just telling me, you know, the first thing he said, hey, man, I'm, it's this program that I want you to be a part of. You know, we're going to have our own money, our own uh, ways to spend money, the green dollar and just what how he explained it to me. It just sounded so beautiful. And, you know, as time went on, I guess as you guys were building you know, he went through his trials and tribulation. I was going through mine, but we always stayed in contact. But just today he hit me. I hit him, he hit me. He was like, hey, Lawrence, I need you to get up to, to jump on this Zoom and, you know, and just let, you know, my people know, my constituents know, you know, what you do. So I'm Lawrence Gant and I'm here just to help 
this Oakland Green Party in, in a media standpoint, you know, with marketing, promotion, helping you guys with commercials, interviewing people, being out in the trenches. I mean, I got documentaries where I'm out with the homeless people in the city of Oakland and, and gentrification documentaries. So, you know, that's just what I want to bring to the table, you know, uh, via Orlando and and you know I just want to really help and, and and just get things balanced out because it seems that the youth just don't have too much to do it and it's just not even in the schools it, it's in the, the just the recreation the after school programs you know it was a village when I was growing up everybody knew each other if you were caught doing something bad you know one of the other parents could could could, 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 could get on your butt about it. It wouldn't be that this parent now is, what you say to my kid, da, 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 da. Now it's parents fighting and it's just, it just wasn't messy like that when I was growing up. So I just wanna get back to that village mentality where everybody is helping everybody. You ain't gotta, you know, I didn't have to worry about being kidnapped too much. We all walk to school together as little kids. Now you can't do that no more. So I just want the roots, the Oakland that, that, that I grew up in. I just want to get halfway back there so, you know, things could change. And that's what I'm going to do. Cool. Thank you. Damon, you're at a place where you can look like you're not driving anymore. No, I just walked up three flights of stairs. And <laughs> I don't <ain't>, know. <laughs> yeah, I got a friend, man. He stay in one of these damn penthouses without an elevator by the lake. He must think I'm still young. Shit. But, uh, Hello, everyone. Brother Suja, man. Uh, I'm a returning family member for first uh, from the Alameda County. We've been in my family moved here from Louisiana and Arkansas. Uh, one part in 1946, the other family in 1957. Um, so related to the Steelwell family, who was my grandfather, Otis Steelwell, who built the Oakland Acorns. Uh, they, him and Slim Jenkins had the first black bowling alley on 7th Street. They had bowling league steel wells. That was my grandfather. Uh, so happened, his life went on. He was killed at Rage Club in 1971 in the murder robbery. Oakland's finest, you know, and then in 1986, I went to prison for the same crime, which I didn't do, but I was involved with. Uh, later on, returning home, now I happen to be uh, the director of the organization nonprofit called Black Men Speak under Alameda County Behavioral Health. Uh, we are speaking, bro, but as we grow, we have uh, outreach where we feed the hungry. We believe in educating. You know, I learned in a different way. I went to college, but also went to the school of hard knocks and you can't teach everybody the same way. So we have another way of addressing the issue besides your normal plan and action where most of our brothers and sisters receive their education to lift and rise above. Uh, and I went with the hard heads and grew up with them from a young age to a middle age and learned a few other things. So my brother me in Orlando, we in a fellowship and we met over the years when I first came home. So I support them 1000, some things as I see the platform of the Green Party develop, uh, we get behind you because if it's about community and change, we 1000 there and our organization will support it. Uh, if we disagree, I will tell you if we disagree, but we're here to support you. Uh, we want to see the platform and uh, invite us. So that's a little bit of me. I ain't did all these great things, but I'm a brother with boots on the ground out here. And uh, just love my community, man. So let me know. That's right. Thank you. Thank One you. love. Anyone else have anything? Or I will definitely comment. One thing that we, we're not afraid of uh, campaigning with uh, houseless communities either. Uh, we are telling them that, trying to remind them that they also get to vote, um, that they are still residents and the things that happen uh, locally really do affect them. Um, and in case you don't know, a lot of people that are houseless, a lot of them are families and those kids go to school. I went, I taught students that did not have places to stay. I taught students who are in elementary school in fifth grade about to go to middle school that are actually the ones that take care of the babies, right? They make the food and everything. Um, another thing I could say too about how, because our philosophy is whole schools, healthy schools and community schools. Um, and one of the whole schools part of that in what I will say is that when I taught at Parker Elementary, 
And this is a st uh, story, uh, anecdote that everybody, people tend to really like. Other than uh, when we were campaigning and the dog, we had it, my daughter's dog with me and we walked forever. But uh, during basketball season, all of the girls that were uh, the best players um, came from three different neighborhoods that suffered from a lot of violence. And I pulled all of those girls, not the parents themselves, just the girls into my office and gave them a monologue about any chance that we could just have a truce and squash any violence, you know, all I need is six weeks is what I said, all I need is six weeks. Um, and it, it did, and not only did it stop for those six weeks, it's actually stopped to this day. Um, I live in the Fruitvale now, but used to live in Havens Court and Bancroft, right around the corner sort of from, uh, from Parker Elementary. So I used to see my students and their families all the time at Gazali's. And to this day, you know, that's one thing they'll say is like, oh, you know, we don't fight anymore. None of our kids, none of our uh, brothers are killing each other from other families. They're not going to jail. So I was like, you know, I, I, the only way I know that it works is proof is in the pudding, right? And that's one of the things I did as far as like what we're at a whole school. Now a healthy school, one of the things we would like to see is bringing cafeterias back. Again, this brings jobs, good paying jobs to people. You would have a head chef at every school. I would advocate that even, uh, we used to say 10, and I'm kind of like saying more, 20% of the vegetables that would be cooked at each school would be grown right there. And why we took that policy of growing, I mean, it's not something new. I mean, the Greens platform, we're the only uh, political party that supports reparations and it's things we've been talking about for a long time, but that we still live in an era of earthquakes and it's coming. If you don't think that we're about to have ours, and you, then you haven't been watching what's going on around the country, 111 degrees in Oregon and Washington, or on the Bay Area here, right? We're in this marine layer. I was like teasing all my family in Arizona where it's 125 and 130. Like, oh yeah, it's 62, I'm gonna put my long johns on. Um, of course I get cussed at for that, but that, it, it's coming. And when that happens, the people that can grow their own food and can make their own tools, are, those are the ones that survive. There's a, mind saying that uh, when was the river changes course follow when the river changes course follow the river because the river knows where it's going and those that fight the river will not survive um, and so if you can follow the patterns and everything the people that will be able to grow their own food and do all these things are the ones that will be able to rebuild and hopefully do better than uh, us as adults have done um, I definitely apologize to all of anyone who was 20 and under going, I'm sorry, you know, that we did not do more to fight this corrupt capitalist system um, for whatever reason. But anyway, so having uh, cafeterias on school and eating healthy. Uh, another antidote when I was teaching in elementary school, my first class was uh, kindergartners. <laughs> and the teacher came and told me that, um, not the name, but Johnny is you know, having a bad day already. And when I got to it, and of course, yep, John's jumping around, can't pay attention, can't do stuff. And then finally I had to ask him, well, what did you have for breakfast? So they had two bowls of Fruit Loops at home and then came to school and had uh, pancakes and French toast and then apparently drank three things of syrup. So no, Johnny's not having a bad day. Johnny's crying like crazy. <laughs> and he's on the sugar high. And sure enough too, right after running him to like in two periods later, when I was at lunch and I went in to check, right? Crashed out, just completely passed out on the desk, right? So, so um, by, you know, we want to have them uh, be more healthy uh, foods. And so you don't have that problem, right? With high fructose corn syrup. I don't want to go deep down that too, but having that as part of your education system, um, the kids get to go out and get their hands in the dirt and grow that way too. And then on the community schools. So uh, we had uh, two people already, but I was talking about that they are part of uh, the nonprofit just trying to help like knucklehead, right? Well, I was um, on uh, what, Richie and MacArthur, right? So that's definitely uh, some knuckleheads in there and all types of issues. But then you would have that person come in and teach a class for the kids and then they get to use uh, a classroom or for some other class that they could actually uh, get compensated for. So you want to 
use the gymnasium to do a free, a free uh, sorry, you wanna do a community karate class, self-defense class. You can definitely do that if you teach the kids for free and then you get to use it on weekends or we'll give you a schedule and you can charge people uh, something in that way. The other thing, which I have never been able to get an answer from, from OUSD, not even Mike, is why, if anyone, I'm a big, I'm a huge sport, I'm a sports fanatic. I am, I love everything from curling to NBA. And uh, we don't have a really good adult or youth basketball program here in Oakland. When I ran my programs in the YMCA, easily, easily 35, 40% of almost half of the people were coming from Alameda County to uh, Walnut Creek and Clayton to, um, to join in our, our programs. Like, why don't we have that here? I know Alameda County itself has one on the city, uh, but it's just 18 and over. I mean, we had a bunch of different ones, but then if OUSD had that, I don't know if there's some rules or laws why they can't, but if they had that and was actually making a profit, they could put that money in damn near fund themselves. Um, and then it opens it up to communities. We have all the gymnasiums. They're all sitting there, right? Not being used. You could be renting them out to uh, other uh, schools and other systems for uh, practices and things like that, or hold tournaments and, you know, and uh, have schools come in and people pay to have tournaments. There's, there's tons of ways to uh, make money. Did I see your hand, Dale? Did I see your hand go up? Did I? Did I? I was just I was just itching myself. But if you'd like <laughs> me to say if you'd like me to say something, I, I do. Won't. You know, I'll go on forever because I'm very passionate about this. But the whole idea of these is to get everyone else. I want to hear ideas from the community. And and basically, let me also rephrase: none of this shit I'm talking about are my ideas. I plagiarize from some of the best and and do that and again i've mentioned mount max well, I've absolutely Vicente, you're to be congratulated because this town hall discussion is probably the, one of the most important things people in oakland could be doing it's so important uh, if you have a you know young children in the public schools or children that are going to be in the uh, uh public schools uh we we've got to have some kind of a democratic approach to how we're going to you know reimagine our our, our schools and we want to ask people the people <laughs> themselves what they want not the billionaire class because they've gotten their way you know with the charters and and, and other things right uh, and i also want to say to to lawrence he made me nostalgic for walking with my it, when i was you know six seven eight nine years old and walked together to a community school uh, that's the dream I think we have right now is to have, you know, a great community school in every neighborhood, not the illusion of choice of running around and shopping for a school like you shop for a TV set or something, uh, something like that. Community schools, as, as I think what we're defining are those that are as, as Mike Hutchinson used to talk all the time about having just a, set, a local center uh, that would have uh, health and social wraparound services of, of so many things from nutritionists and everything that, that Vicente uh, mentioned, child psychologists, all of these things uh, should be uh, located there and they stay open even for adult education in the evening, things like, like that. These schools they shouldn't be, be, be you know, up for sale and sold off to the developers. These things are treasures that the city uh, 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 has. And there's so much, I think, that we, we can change now. Things, that, even in my neighborhood, talk, talking to my neighbors, they sort of see this kind of need too. They're, they're disillusioned a bit with the, the charter schools. They read the newspaper about how the Oakland Public Schools in terms of how they're performing are doing as, as, as well as the charters, if not better than the charters. Obviously there's some good charter schools, admittedly. My neighbor right next door to me here, his child is in the, the Francophone uh, charter uh, uh, school and she, she loves it. Uh, uh, they're, very, they're very happy. Uh, this is the Glenview neighborhood here where the Glenview people that I talked to 
uh, they like to contribute to the, the PTA meetings and they're enthusiastic and they're, I, I think, seeing the having, you know, a, a vision that we're starting to share, getting back to the community schools uh, and uh, reading all the, you know, the literature about it in terms of what, what we can do and why we can't. Yes, Lawrence. Yes, no, just to, just to add on to what he's saying, I think where the problem, where the disconnect happened at is where even in the streets that these police officers are policing and not part of the community. These teachers are teaching and not part of the community. I like think that that's like the basis cooking everything down to the oil base as we say in the streets that so there's not a genuine care and love you know, they're go the police going to going to work for a check. The teachers coming in for a check, but they're not passionate about what they're doing and, and what they've got going on. So now it's a it's a bit of a, a frustration. So the police wants to deal with everything with the pistol, you know, and, and teachers want to expel the kid. Back when I was in school, you didn't get suspended. You had to stay at school. You didn't get to be in the class, but you had to go sit in the office or you would sit in the principal's office and, and would have extra work to do. And then you would still get in trouble. So I think that's where, where, where the disconnect and the problems just happen at, that these people who are in the community and working in the community are not from the community and have just no genuine care about what's going on in Oakland because, you know, these teachers, they live in, they consider Piedmont, well, that's Oakland, but, you know, they, they, they leave from Manzanita, Garfield, or, or Oakland High to their house in the hills or wherever they live at. And, 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 you know, it's just a job to them. It's not that, you know, but there are some teachers that, and police officers that are passionate. Yesterday, we had police officers and district attorneys and special investigators at the East Oakland Youth um, Development Center where um, I, yes, I got a banner put up on 84th and East 14th um, for a, a, a logo that I made that says, stop killing our kids, peace in the streets. So I did that with Adamika Village, the boss program, Oakland Frontline Healers. So I'm I'm just gathering up all my resources and my knowledge and just bringing what I know, my, my knowledge, my experience, and just, you know, to be a voice because I'm from the streets. I grew up in the streets. I, I've been incarcerated. I've, I've seen the highs of life and I've seen the lows of life. So when I speak, I'm speaking with, like you say, with, with passion, with experience, and can't nobody tell me that what I'm saying is wrong. I know for a fact that the, that this is a major problem. The police are policing communities that they are not a part of, and the teachers are teaching kids that they really, you know, don't really, you know, care. So Gabriel, I get Gabriella. <laughs> I see you with your hand up. So go ahead. Gabriella, please, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, I'm a I'm a fifth grade teacher. And, you know, I was teaching my students um, at the beginning of the school year. Actually, this Jamboard is from September 11th of 2020. And this is what they had to say. And we were, and you'll, you'll get the gist of what the topics were that um, we were talking about. And they say here, I learned that the Equal Protection Clause said that restricting the sale of a home on the basis of race was not allowed. I think that they should be free to vote they even wanted to be free. It was wrong not to let them be free. I, what I learned about the constitution from the Shelley versus Kramer, that it protects people to live wherever they choose. I learned that they fought for freedom and insisted on freedom. They also wanted a home. Another student, I learned that people fought for freedom and they don't, they didn't stop so they can have equal rights. And guess what? We are still in this conversation. We are still in this conversation. And what Lawrence just spoke of, we are still in this conversation of freedoms, right? And I wanted to share these stories with you because I want to show you that kids get it more than adults. You know, and, um, and right now, you know, I'm, I'm working on putting together an article on police free schools. You know, um, I am a child of an alcoholic. And um, so this is not a personal story. You guys have shared some personal stories. So I feel comfortable sharing my personal story. Um, and so when I married an alcoholic, which is why I get, have Mitchell, I married an alcoholic. 
And because that's the pattern, right? You, your father's an alcoholic, you're going to marry an alcoholic. So that happened to me. And so I've been in recovery in Al Anon for more than 15 years. And so I'm having to address my character defects because I was affected from alcoholism. And one of the ways that I was affected was that when my counselor, uh, you know, when I went to counseling, I was referred to a psychologist and they diagnosed me with anxiety. So they told me that that was the lowest of the spectrum of, of mental health, you know, uh, illnesses. And so that's what I suffer from. Those are my effects from the disease of alcoholism is anxiety. And even though it's at the lowest of the spectrum, when it comes on, it's pretty powerful. Um, and in any event, um, so what I'm why I'm sharing this with you is that when I think about community schools, I think about all the families that are affected because I'm having to address character defense, defenses or character defects in my behavior. And over 15 years, I'm still addressing them because it's an onion. There's layers of it. So the sooner the kids are able to address these behaviors, um, as I was, as, as they're growing up, the easy, the better adults they're going to be, and they're not going to find themselves in the spaces like Damien did, you know, because they're going to address the, the, the situations ahead of time. I was fortunate enough that I didn't end up in jail because, you know, a counselor, I was referred to a counselor who then referred me to the 12 step work that I've done. Um, but my ex-husband, he's homeless, you know. So he has a severe, a severe um, consequence, right? And what I'm saying is we need community schools because I'm gonna also share this with you. In this recovery step work, um, I'm gonna say it's 95% white, okay? That are in these spaces. And so this affects every group, every, every group in the country. And what I see is that, for example, my, our sister or our, or our founding you know, group was Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, guess what? That, that, that phrase, anonymous, people don't even wanna talk about the disease. It's a disease. It's not a choice, it's a disease. But people don't even wanna talk about it. They wanna make it anonymous because society does not accept this disease. You know, It's like, let's wake up. Let's talk about the things that are gonna help us move forward in society. And one of the answers is a community school that is addressing these mental health situations so that teachers are then informed and then they can alert them, you know, because now they're aware of the patterns and then they can provide the, the proper spaces with the counselor because they're going to need the teacher to help them because the child can't address patterns because they don't know them. But the teacher, if she's aware, can then address the counselor and then move forward in a constructive pathway. You know, so um, talk about reimagine, yes. Reimagine because there is too much in society that we want to make anonymous because we're not comfortable. And, and, you know, it's not okay. I don't believe it's okay. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. And I would definitely agree with that. So when I taught, I was working for, it's now called Playworks. It used to be Sports for Kids in 2006. The first question that I was asked on my interview, my first interview, was, am I comfortable having conversations around gender, race, and ethnicity with elementary school kids? I was like, are you kidding? You're damn right I can, right? And gave them a scenario of how I would approach to elementary school kids going, oh, that's gay or whatever. Um, obviously I got the job. Um, and then for that same social justice, I uh, was, was never not asked back after four years. They got rid of all of, once they started getting large grants, you could see that they started pushing out all of the social justice educators um, along with that. So that's something when I say, again, because sports is really close to my heart, of a philosophy of Juan Carlos and Tommy Smith, so again, in case you don't know, um, and again, and also for the seven people that watch this on YouTube. So right now, and so we're having on uh, the corporate media, everybody's talking about all these gymnasts that are just seem getting younger and younger and younger. I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole, but that are doing these incredible things. Um, and 
what they don't say and what they, I feel they should say, make sure this is my own uh, philosophy is not those of the Oakland Greens is that they, when they have those conversations about how great they should also talk about how rampant child abuse is within those sports. And I mean, every, all of these ladies are coming out about how it goes. And it's not just through the national teams uh, that go to Olympics and world championships. Peyton Manning, one of the most beloved quarterbacks, right, has a laundry list of sexual assault charges against him throughout college with his trainers doing like weird, weird shit. And it's just the culture that we teach. Well, I think, and I only think this and know it by, by proof, is that you can flip that philosophy by educating and by, as you say, Gabriella, talking about these issues, not just alcoholism, rape, sexual assault, all types of, my third year at Parker, a fifth grader was raped by some of the dealers in the neighborhood and actually and was pregnant, had to leave school, brought me to tears. It gets me so fucking hot when I even think about it because we do not have these conversations and it needs to happen. So even like Dale was saying, having mental health, we were like, oh, you are a, you just graduated from college and you want to be a therapist. Well, you know what? If you come in and donate your time to our community school and help these kids, you can then set up a classroom with whatever and then and charge people to come in and do sessions. There's, there's all types of ways that we can jump out of uh, the norm to, um, to allow, to get, to get ourselves to it. Again, not just teaching, but educating people to be great residents and work together again, community schools. Something else uh, I guess had brought up too about walking to and from school, which is also very triggering to me because when I was 14, 14, I went to, uh, in full transparency, I went to private school in Maryland. My brother went to private school in Washington, DC. I would leave school in the, in the afternoon, the afternoon, get on a bus, go to the metro station in Maryland, get on the metro, go from Maryland to Virginia to DC, walk across the mall every day, pick up my brother, and then we get back on the metro and then bus all the way back home to Maryland every day. Now you got a parent let their kid ride their bike home from the park, they're getting arrested and CPS is taking their kids from them. I was like, whoa, what's going on? I, it's just it's just too much. But again, having that community takes away any threat. You don't got to be afraid of your kid riding home from the park because everybody's working together. And you know that's a, by design too. They want us to to fight each other. Um, again, also hip hop generation, de la soul, right? Neighbors aren't neighbors anymore. Just animals with animal behavior, right? I mean, I ain't like that. I know everybody in my complex. I know. I mean, it's, it's small. There's 13 units, but I know who, where the drama is, and what can transfer into education, into an education system for community schools. If they're if over the pandemic, when there's a domestic dispute here, do you think that any of us are calling the cops? Any of us black folks are calling the police? Of course, fuck no, we're not calling the cops. We know they're not gonna handle it. We do it ourselves. We come together as a community, go to the door. Hey, is there any way we can help? What, what do you need? Or does somebody just even you want to come down? Yo, man, we, get, we have a blunt. What do, you need, what do you need for this to de-escalate now? And because once you get into that space, you're not having a constructive conversation anyway, right? But the community comes together and deals with it and works it out. And that's how it should be in schools for any kid who's suffering from uh, the effects of alcoholism or even poverty in their own neighborhoods. There has to be a space that they can feel safe and be able to discuss that and realize one, they're not alone, right? Everyone in that neighborhood is probably going through something of the same, same issues um, and bringing that all together. So that's how, that's one of the different ways that I think that we can uh, put that together. It's, it's actually easily funded. It will not raise uh, working class people's taxes, but it will make um, people who have, it always gets me because I don't think, I'm, I'm changing my philosophy. I don't think it's also about just wealth inequality. This is just about control. The reason that they keep the poor fighting the poor and there's this whole classist system and all that is because they want to make sure 
that they, whoever they are in your mind, whether it be Bezos, like billionaire classes, 1%, there's tons of labels out there. They want to maintain their superior art and their version of life because they don't want everyone to get it. Right now we have this illusion that everyone can be Bezos or everyone can you know, get LeBron money and shit like that. That's not, that's not true. At least not in the way that we're, that they're running capitalism. It sure fuck isn't, right? And also, is that how we, why should we judge ourselves on the material things and how much money we have as well? Um, I personally, right now, am at a place that if I was to die tomorrow, I've lived a really, really good life. And most of that had to do with when I taught at Parker, the 85 kids that went through my program and the success that they had. And uh, again, like Gabrielle what Ella said too, they get it. They get it better than adults. Um, when I taught, um, when I ran my uh, youth and adult sports programs, I used to go to San Ramon and I, you know, give presentations at schools or whatever. And so I'd be telling them, so my own, and this is not open green and not anyone's, my personal view, I don't, I think all youth sports from kindergarten up to middle school should be co-ed. Um, and you shouldn't have like right after uh, puberty. In fact, there's even uh, uh, middle school, I think also should be co-ed. Uh, you do it by divisions, but should always be co-ed. Uh, again, which will smash gender barriers. When I had a, my boys team, my youngest son, we went undefeated a year and they got really, really cocky. Far be it from me to take away anyone's bragging rights. <laughs> I am not that full transparency. I got an ego as big as anybody. And but they were, I was trying to, trying to rein that in a little bit. I was also coaching a girls team in Richmond that played way better together and, and bought them in, showed them like, oh, and of course they had the, oh, we're gonna whip them up, they're girls, right? Yeah, no, man, they, my, my, the lady stomped them, just stomped them all the time. And, and that actually, again, they got it. They were like, oh, right, I can't, we cannot go, especially, in that age group of kids, you can't go by uh, gender at all because I had my son now is like six five two seventy. He's been six feet since he was a teenager, right? Since he's been preteen, right? But then someone his same age was small, really tiny. So it was very very interesting. But I think all of those things definitely uh, can work. And I will open again. And I again how actual system. So we've talked about uh, like community schools and being able to walk to and from school. Within that, what else could we do? What else would a community school look like? Greg, yes, please. And then yeah, Well, um, the main thing that uh, I wanted to do is ask a question about uh, Action 2020. But before I do that, uh, I just uh, want to kind of second what people have said about walking to school. I, uh, I grew up in Oakland near uh, 55th Avenue. And uh, yeah, I used to walk to school, Sherman Elementary School, but uh, it's now some kind of charter. I don't even know the name of it now. Uh, and I spent one year at Parker too, and that was a little too far. So um, I got a, got a bus pass. So I used to take the bus pass to Parker. Um, but yeah, uh, the main thing I did want to ask was about um, Action 2020 because um, last year, the Green Party supported a bunch of uh, candidates for the school board. And um, I think what a couple couple of them that we, we supported uh, did win. So, so my question is about uh, all these issues that we've been discussing here about all the problems in the school system. Um, to, to what extent um, did Action 2020 candidates have positions that would address all or most of those issues, or were there some issues that we've discussed so far or that other people are thinking about that, that really weren't addressed by the Action 2020 program? I, I you know, wasn't that accurate, so I don't know the details of uh, the platform and, and what was addressed and what wasn't addressed uh, by the candidates. Uh, Lawrence, and then I will answer that question. Okay, I, I, if you want to go ahead and answer it so, so it stays se so it's seamless. Go ahead and answer okay. his question. Um, so uh, they didn't because, well, they, in, when they talked the big game, but when they got there, we realized that Mike is really the only, um, the only, the, like is the most progressive candidate out there. Um, we have, we did approach Mike uh, about using some, so the biggest thing for, we're, they're getting $300 million for COVID relief. 
they want to put money into nurses for all the schools and what's the other one i think it was special needs as well and then the third one that came up was uh youth sports and specifically around the aquatics program um and the reason that that picked aquatics is just because swimming is an all-around sport it works all your muscles and everything and doing the infrastructure of the pool systems of the the high schools and then opening it up for everyone so really mike was the only candidate that was open in, to any of that and right now action 2020 is doing the same thing where for their monthly meetings at the beginning of the meeting they have someone come on and give a 15 minute presentation like we're discussing here about putting things into practical policy opening up for conversation and the first one i did on sports education and did a deep dive into that uh, you can see that on our youtube channel oakland greens and next one is coach tapscott is going to talk about um, ethnic uh, equality within uh, education equality uh, ethnicity in there too. So um, again, answering those questions, the two talk, but th all three talked a big game. Two of them got in there and immediately, Mike said, voted Shanti Gonzalez president. Um, will not come out and say that they are against charter schools uh, and had nothing uh, to say about any sort of uh, uh, youth sports education other than Mike. Mike, of course, is definitely your anti charter candidate. All that. And I also think that he'll be good about keeping cops off campus, things too. And we could probably sway him on sports because he's also a big sports person. Um, but I have said, and this is where I'll end, is that Mike is the most progressive candidate on there. And, th and that's an issue. We, we want more support for Mike and we want people that are way more radical and progressive outside of the box than he. If he was the most conservative, we would see a huge shift in the education system here in Oakland. And Lawrence, please go. OK, so uh, like a solution to what he was asking, you need people like me. You need people to take this, these type of forms that we're having. And then I take the message and bottle it up and give it to the urban community uh, to their understanding, because it's just a certain frequency when you're hearing things from from people who like you, they they tend to grasp on it more. When I go out and speak to the public or speak to the kids, I'm looking like a big brother or uncle. I'm not going to speak to them with the button up shirt and the tie on, you know, and, and looking like a probation officer or a police officer or an investigator with this with this persona like I'm coming to break up the home. So that's where people like me come in and, you know. And I just take what we're doing and I make them understand it. Hey, we need you to vote. We need these things. We need you to start paying more attention. Uh, but my battery was seeming like it was going dead. We need you. We need your parents to be involved, not just dropping your kids off at school like this is a daycare. It's like the whole shift of this world and just the, the world that I knew. It just doesn't exist anymore. But that's a I just said probably about five solutions, you know, all in one. But basically, that's what it needs. We need to get these parents involved and we need to take these messages and these big words and compress them and, 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 and deliver a message that where people can understand. And, and I think that that would, would really, really help if, if we can just start having more, just making things more legible. Instead of writing things in cursive, let's write it in regular print. You know, let's, let, let's, let's enlarge these, these letters so they can see it and not have to look into the screen and see what it is. Let's, let's start writing these messages in the sky. And, and, and like I said, with Orlando, that's, that's been my, my take with a lot of my friends. I work social media. I've been doing social media since 2005, 2006. 2006. I started this love and passion of, of sharing messages in multimedia on my space. And I just saw that when this shift came that now everybody has a phone in their hand. So it's ways that we can use technology to get these messages out. And, and it's just, it, it, it's just a, it would be a beautiful thing. And, and once again, like Orlando, it introduced it to me. He's like, "L, you got to be a part of this." You know, he told me this. Like I say, man, more probably more than even five years ago, he introduced me to this to to the to the Oakland Greens party, and and I and I'm still here. So now he like, "Hey, it's time to take off." We wasn't as polished, 
you know, we had a conversation before we got on on um, about two, three hours ago. And he was like, well, hey, this is what it is right now. We, we, we up and running. When I was talking to you, we were still in the in the beginning phase of it, you know, in a prime, not even primary, just the introduction. You guys were still building. But now that I see that you guys, you know, got your feet wet, everybody is, is we it's, it's a team now. It wasn't just my friend coming to tell me about something, you know, that could or could not be. No, nah, it's really real now, and and I'm here, and I want to add my my everything that I got, all my resources, to what you guys are doing. And it is true, we did not navigate the corrupt capitalist capitalist system very well, um, but we are now, and we are continuing to grow. Um, and honestly, like the pandemic, actually, uh, or just before the pandemic, really, really helped us when we were doing these, and we did one with uh, Rosa Clemente, and. Uh, people really liked uh, what we were trying to do here. It was also true, I want to say that I definitely see always the, the benefits of banners and protests and everything. But like you just said, we need involvement. We need people to run. I can't remember what state it was, but uh, someone, and I, although I do agree, this, this should have been closed door and not uh, definitely, uh, but on public or recording like what we're doing here. It's not, we're not broadcasting live, but recording. Um, and it goes up unedited, full transparency. But they said on the camp, these are a bunch of teachers. And they said about parents who, well, they drop them off in kindergarten and want to pick them up in graduation in 12th grade. That, that's, a, that's a joke because it's serious, right? Because yeah. Because they've got, again, the system is so corrupt, people are just dying. And, and I will also full transfer, admit that there'd be days where uh, it was a struggle. Uh, there'd be a murder or something happened. So it makes it more difficult to keep uh, a, a lid on it and discuss it with kids. Just really, really heavy emotionally. I'd be having a bad day and I'd be walking at lunch down to get uh, juice or down the corner store, lunch, something. And they would, I'd see parents who are just sitting around, sitting in front, not doing it, just drinking, smoking. Have, oh, great, right? I love to do that too. I'd real, rather not, I say this often, I don't wanna be an activist on purpose. I'd much rather be smoking pot, playing video games, <laughs> but I can't in good conscience because I see this all the time. But we had those same people. So I would, I again, having a bad day, I would lose it on them. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? We need you on the playground. We need you here. Do you know how many kids that I have that I'm trying to operate on by myself with using other elementary kids, uh, uh, other elementary kids <laughs> to be the referees of these games, whether it be four square or wall ball? Like we need you. Your kids need you. Nope, like because they're so stressed, they need that release and whatever it is they're doing, and they can't. Do it. I'm like, well, you know. And then again, I take it again. Personally, again, my own ego. I'm like, motherfucker, I want to do that too, but you can't. You fucking can't. Stop it. Um, hey, Vicente. Yeah. Hey, I want to add to what you were saying. Like, hey, it was a situation that happened like maybe a month and a half ago. Man, it was a killing in front of the kids' football game. This guy went to the football thing and killed this dude. Nobody is even wondering, these kids are now gonna be traumatized. I'm 45 and I'm now just starting to see that I have these PTSDs and this fear of certain things. I hear gunshots, I duck and I, I see the police. I don't, I got license and insurance. I get scared. So it's like, nobody's even reaching in back to these kids like these kids are going to be troubled for the rest of their lives they seen this happen they heard it happen so the guy was standing by certain kids but this guy walked to the field and shot these people in front of family kids and everything but nobody really worrying about the mental health of what these kids are going go, going to be going through because now through video games it's so normalized Get Greg the kids playing call of duty and and it, it's 10 15 people as a team sniping people and, and getting extra points for hitting people in the head or one shot kills. So it's like, I really know that this, that this, that, that just the world is so, we're so numb to, to, to violence and things like that. It's like, oh, another person dead. Um, my kid gonna be okay. No, your kid's not gonna be okay. You know, your kid's gonna be murdering somebody or it's just gonna be, you know, it just, it, it just needs to stop, man. We gotta get out into this community. We got, we got to start 
as they say, man, putting our skin in our skin on the ground, man. We got to, man, because all the talk, talk, nothing happens when you talk. I noticed that even me studying history, when you start messing with people's money and finances and stuff like that, with their personal lives, when it comes to their neighborhoods, now they want to change. But as long as they're killing people on, 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 on that side of MacArthur, we cool because we live on this side of MacArthur. Nothing happens up there. And it's literally like I'm from the base. So I know that's why I said MacArthur, right? On this side, nothing really happens. But on that side, the flatlands, as it's called, man, it's just it, it's just a kill zone out there. And, and, and I just wanted to stop, man. I, we had a great meeting yesterday out there with the police and stuff like that. But it could have been hundreds of people. I say it was maybe 75 of us out there, but it was supposed to be 7,500 of us with police escorts and everything out there, but everybody turning the cold shoulder, you know, to the situation. We, we, we on 84th between 82nd, the East Oakland Youth Center to 84th, where there's people doing drugs. You seeing people nodding off, you know, and, and just trash everywhere. And the police and everybody, you know, everybody, it, it was like, it was normal to us. We were still out there having our thing, having a ribbon cutting ceremony with people selling drugs, people riding by with their music, people burning rubber. And it was just like normal everyday life in Oakland to where when those things don't happen, you feel like when it's when it's too quiet, you like, oh, something's wrong. It's like we don't we we scared of peace, but we, you know, it's just wow, man. I don't know. I'm just speaking from the heart, man. I'm from the bay. I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm from right. old school 415 Oakland. Not this five one no, not this five <laughs> ten area. <laughs> right. And yeah, man. Saw, so y'all got uh, y'all got my heart in this. My phone dying. I don't want it to just to die in this, but y'all will be hearing much more from me. Orlando's gonna connect me. We're gonna have some meetings. I'm pretty sure me and you, Vicente, we're gonna have some meetings. We're gonna sit down, Greg, everybody, man. I, I got a lot of resources, man. I'm old school. Manzanita, Hollis Green, and Herb Chan, man. So let's do it, man. Yeah, we do this pretty much the second weekend third weekend and final weekends of every month there's some sort of event and i saw damon's uh hand up next and then gabriella okay i put this information in the chat oh thank you yes, yes. Uh, thank you orlando blood i see y'all i'm about to I, I got another little webinar i gotta jump on man <laughs> all right peace good <laughs> yeah uh, i'm listening to this um uh, and I'm looking from a different perspective, you know, mine. So uh, some of the guys about the education on what's going on here in Oakland. And after dealing with this pandemic, how what will this new world look like? Because it won't look anything like it looked before. And how do we improve this system? I'm not a victim, you know. Uh, and I want to be assertive and I want to be involved in the process, not a bitching process. But to say, what can we do? because uh, we keep blaming the kids. I had a brother named Alvin Holmes who passed in prison after 40 some years, but he wrote a poem called, uh, Why Do We Blame the Kids? You know, we want to help the kids, but these keep being adult problems. And I hear us here tonight, even some young people, I'm looking for some young people who are going through the system. I graduated in 1980, so I don't know nothing about the school system, you know? Uh, but I know I need to talk to the experts and that would be the people going through it and not me working from a parent or a grandfather or an elder who's been out of school because I walked, I enjoyed school and I, my grandkids, I'm a grandfather and they walked to school, you know, now we have them in the Hayward district, but we right here from the back, you know, um, and some of these things is perspective, how you look at it, but the solution, babe, what can we do to change this dominant thought? And I say, well, hopefully next time we got some young people in here, you know, because it's like a man trying to tell a woman what fits her best when she should, could speak for herself, you know. So I would get us young people some more data in here to support what these changes could be, because I'm not moving out of Oakland. And as you know, I left in 86 when Oakland had the highest homicide, hom homicide rate. It's not like that today. We do have violence, conduct disorder, all these social maladies going on. So how do we change our, you know, for these young people killing people as we see here, this mindset of, uh, I don't want to say any social behavior because when you look it up, you know, you still judge it from a European perspective of what 
antisocial is when our kids have conduct problems, you know, in our community, you know, we, I'm talking about a community, I hear a lot of anxiety, fears and all that to say, well, if you replace it, what you don't replace it with? You know, so I'm, I'm still gathering data to say, what can we do to make this community better? You know, and have, have some young folks here, you know, and let them tell us because they know what they need. You know, these are they friends killing each other. So what is going on to make them feel like that? Is the education system working? Because when I was in prison, man, we, you know, right now today, we get people to do stuff by providing stipends, just like they're providing stipends for uh, to take the shot, you know? Right, right. So, I don't want to yes. What is the incentive? Because you're asking people to move their needle. So, you know, why should they change, you know, if it's going to be the same thing? But what I'm going to get out of, you know, and one thing with the brother started off with was, you know, we need living wage jobs, you know, because I remember a kid growing up here and said, uh, you know, you could buy a home here in Oakland for $24,000, you know, and you had a living wage job where you felt proud and healthy. And so we didn't have those problems as kids because we had financial security. We had jobs, economical power. So when that left out of here with the cr uh, crack epidemic and we've seen coming, now we have all these other anxieties. But give a black man a job, give a poor man a job. And I guarantee his environment will increase and do better. But if we look at what's going on here, you know, our community, I speak for the African-American, we're not working like we should. You go down here on these corners, this new development they have, I came home, I drove from Hayward all the way to Berkeley by street. And they develop in Hayward, then you get in East Oakland, it don't look like it's a big develop, but we don't have the credit. They take the Coliseum, they redline us, we don't have banks. We won't be there any longer. So what is the systematic plan also going on? So it don't make me a damn difference. What's the school look like if I ain't living here no more? You know, so who are we changing it for? You know, what kids, you know, we talking about? You know, cause I feel, uh, you know, like San Francisco had the largest black home ownership for a time, not 3% of the population. And so what are we planning for? Cause of these laws and changes we, will our children be or they'll be for somebody else. So I also asked that how, you know, what we bring about. And that was just for me listening to you brothers and sisters here and just saying, you know, what I would have to say about it. Thank you. Right, thank you. And we're gonna Gabriella and then Orlando. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I find that um, it's very important for me um, to, you know, understand history because if I look back at history, then I learn, and one of the things that I learn are the lessons from history, you know? And so I'm reading, um, uh, I haven't finished, I'm halfway through, um, you know, Johnny Cochran, Journey to Justice. And um, Damon, you'll have, you'll know that his, his parents came from Louisiana I think it was the same situation as yours, Damien. They came from Louisiana to Oakland, uh, and I think it was steel. I think that was the steel that, that, that they came to, for work there, and then they moved to Los Angeles. And then, then you know, and I think his dad was an insurance. Wait, hang on. Yeah, he he sold insurance. So in in any event, um, what that story is teaching me is that, um, you know, he was in this same kind of thing as Vicente and Dale and Greg and Orlando and Damien. He was in the same thing, but it was back in the um, 1970s. And well, actually the Panthers thing was in the early seventies, right? The Panthers were in the early seventies. So he defended some of, the, some of the people in the Panthers party. So in any event, um, so I'm learning so much of the stuff that was going on there is still going on now. And I think that we're finally in a space where we actually get to transform, transform, you know, and so I think I feel that, you know, I feel um, invigorated um, that we can finally um, do things differently. And, I, and I'm really grateful that Damien is sharing because 
I think he brings a perspective of, you know, being like, for example, in prison and what, what could have made that situation different for him? If certain things were in place, what would have made a difference? I'm thinking that that's where he's speaking from, from those experiences. He's giving us hope that if these certain things were in place, my life would have taken a different trajectory, you know? And so that's why I think it's important to hear those lessons from those individuals where, um, you know, they made it out. They made it out from that systemic thing. They made it out, uh, but, um, but there's still lessons that can be learned because he was able to make it out to tell his story. Thanks. Well, and it is systemic, right? When, when you talked about the crack epidemic, um, so I graduated in 82, uh, went right into the Navy. And when Reagan was allowing the military to work with the Coast Guard, I can't think of how many times we would be in the air and would see a boat or plane. And it's obviously they're doing dirty, right? Why would you be flying that low or that late? It's just obvious. And before we could tell the Coast Guard about what we see, we had to send a message to who knows who the fuck, right? Either the CIA or somebody and get permission to release that information to local law enforcement stopping all the fucking cocaine and shit coming into the country. It's like, well, okay, so you're just allowing that, again, because you're allowing it to flood into the poor areas. You don't allow it for anything else. And then that epidemic becomes the same parents who are just sitting in front of their house smoking where I made the, the, the serious, the joking serious, right? To laugh, to keep from crying about dropping them off in kindergarten and pick them up in 12th grade. Those parents that I would flip out on have, after having a bad day, right? Those are the kids and grandkids of the people who are suffering from the fucking crack epidemic. It's like, it's, oh, it's all, you know, it's all by design. Now, another way, and I also admit that I am having a huge struggle with how to get more people engaged. Um, I definitely am a believer in, in speaking to your audience. Something uh, that Lauren said about, oh, depending on where I am, when I'd be having the conversations with the drug dealers that were posted up out in front of my house, same thing. I'm not like where, I mean, luckily I was in a job where I didn't have to wear a suit, but I wouldn't come at them looking like a parole officer, wearing my normal clothes, come out having a beer, talk to them. And when I would talk to them and would ask them, it was like, oh, do you, do you want this for your kids? Fuck no, of course they don't, right? No, who wants to have, be harassed by the police and be fucking 35 years old selling nickel bags in the fucking corner. That's like, we love, again, we're very ego-based and that's not a good look. <laughs> 35 years old selling nickel bags, you ain't no baller. I'm just, you know, sorry to tell it to you, but you're not. Um, but they would not want that for their kids. So I also do have a, a problem how to engage, but some positive things I can say, and it's, it's all my time at Parker. So we would also part of my job responsibilities was I coached all the school sports teams. Um, so we would go and we'd play other schools at gyms. And of course, when you were down even, you know, uh, 98th uh, and international, you get down there and people would come into an elementary school volleyball game and like the whole place would smell like weed. Not because people were smoking in the gym, but they just would smoke outside and then come back in. And again, I'm like, again, I, smoke. I, I, I broke my back in 2002 and I've used cannabis instead of opioids forever. So that wasn't my bitch, but I'm like, it's still not a good look. This is an elementary school game. Really? You gotta, this, this ain't a party, right? It's a, it's a elementary school game and you're not uh, uh, mature enough to do some mouthwash, nothing, right? Edibles, like we're in California. You know how many other ways there are to do cannabis? You don't gotta smoke pot to get, to get high. There's tons and tons of ways that you could go around it. But approaching them and giving them the respect and just having that conversation, uh, adult to adult, community to community, you're right, Coach Cruz, and you, you're right, you're right, right? This ain't, this ain't the place. I'm like, oh, all right. Cool, right? That's how you do that. Same thing uh, when I would come and have to pick up needles or people would, there'd be beer bottles from the locals coming over the fence and partying in the playground and they'd like want to tag stuff. I'm like, that's not ball or you repping in elementary school. I'm like, I don't know, call me from North Philly, but that's not how we roll over there. <laughs> this isn't 
doesn't seem like you're some big badass, right? It just doesn't seem that way to me. And, and showing them different perspectives and being able to talk to people, again, know your audience and you get a lot more uh, respect that way. So I don't know how to motivate them other than uh, that way. And then again, on the days where I can't hold my emotion when, and it's coming from uh, a place of frustration, uh, that's not productive, but those are the only two ways and what we've been doing now, uh, we've done it once and we will do it again, is, well, especially when we get back to live in-person events and we can actually go out to rallies uh, really safe, which on a side note, I'm not sure the pandemic is completely over. We'll see what happens in fall. Uh, we may be in for a huge another lockdown and hopefully they'll just pay everybody to stay home and give them that wage and show that it can be done. But anyway, um, once we can get back, I. Uh, and this is also a policy of the Oakland uh, Greens is rallies, things like that should always be used to try to find candidates and staff those candidates. Man, if we had a really powerful influencer here in California, there is a great chance that they could become governor. If we had a social justice, a people before profit candidate, we could get them elected if we could staff it and all that because it's going to be such a shit show. You wouldn't even need to win so much of the vote, right? Um, but again, haven't found it. And every person that I have talked to, and I have, how many, I've talked to six or eight people. I see your hand too, Greg, coming next. Six or eight people, all either uh, people who identify as women or in the LGBTQ community. So I'm even thinking outside of the normal, any sort of uh, gender, you know, the normal people that would be running. I'm going to ask them, but they make great great governors, city council, all that. But sadly, and the thing I'm getting the most is they won't because they are actually doing, even though they know it's a corrupt system, but they're navigating it extremely well. And it, it does pain me, but I love them and respect them. So, uh, so, you know, I mean, you can, you don't, I don't like a lot of my family, but I love all my family. So I love them and respect them, but I just, I can't agree with that. It, it's so fucking frustrating. It drives me crazy because they would be great. And it would be like an instant transformation. Um, and maybe too, I guess, uh, and this is where I, before I, I saw your hand, Greg, is that not only are they able to navigate this corrupt system fairly well, is that they actually make enough money that it, when, you know, they may have to pay some more taxes. So it could, that could be an issue as well. So uh, Greg, you had your hand, correct? Oop, unmute yourself. I think we need a show called Unmute Yourself. <laughs> no, I, I was not raising. I, I, I had something I was uh, taking off of my eyebrows. Oh, so okay. I wasn't, right. okay. Sorry. No worries, none at all. So I think that that is how uh, we definitely need to go about it. And that is definitely what I'm on now is trying to convince people to vote for alternative parties locally. I get it, right? It's a corrupt two-party system and it's they make it very, very difficult for any, not just the Greens, where I don't like, I don't use third party anymore uh, alternatives because there's definitely more than three already, um, but they make it very difficult on a national scale uh, to get anything into that. So, and I see your hand, Orlando, please. Oop, yep. yep, could you hear me now? Okay, I, I think like one of the main issues is, like I said, I'm born and raised in East Oakland. And when we was kids, I know we had like the Malibu, the Castle, the Roxy's, the Lux, but I do agree when the crack came in, it really took a lot of us young kids. We was all together, East Oakland, West Oakland, North Oakland, but we all had funner things to do. But when the violent side start coming in with the guns and so forth, it's sporadic. I did 11 years and two months in the California Youth Authority. Uh, I understand how being taken away from an educational system, but I also understand how to work with the educational system. A lot of our young kids' parents is illiterate. So when the kids, the parents don't got a high school diploma, they don't know algebra, they don't know this, it makes a different effect. So when our generation was, our parents was a little more educated or self-educated. But when you look at the era of the ecstasy pills, the 2000 to 2005, and you look at all the kids from the 2000 generation era, a lot of those parents was filled by the broken system. 
the welfare system, the the SSI system, because a lot of the children was SSI babies. They was the stimulus of the repo. Hey, you go get this, you ADD, you got this. Now that you're in a system to where them is real category. Like me, I was labeled bipolar, schizophrenic, paranoid. The only job that they said I can work at is at a warehouse. I can't be around people, antisocial. It was a false stigma. So to sum it up through my education, I explain to people, I've been in a group home, but I also get kids to understand is, man, you got to do accountability. You know, like my mother smoked coke, my, uh, my whole family, you know, they was in the a, in a action, but it didn't stop, make me go smoke no coke or, you know, put a needle in my arm. So a lot of these kids is pacified. So make another long story short, when we talking about young folks, we got to really put a category on what's considered young folks. So when a lot of the shooting is going on, they said the young folks is doing it. Man, they 27, 28, 35. Them is grown men is doing things. You know, the 16 to 14 year old. Now them young folks, you know, they haven't hit puberty. So when we disfranchise would categorize and even when we talk about disfunding the police department, all these issues, whatever, the, the police department get half of any city's budget. So we're going to get that clear. So anything that they give you, they're going to reimburse you back and they're going to tax you. I give you a million dollars for this building. You want to pay the county or the sheriff department to police this. So I'm just more into my experience. And, you know, most people don't know. That's what made me run for mayor. So I met Wilson Rouse former city council member. It was in uh, 2000, I was hustling in the streets, getting money. He said, I want you to get involved in the politics. Stop selling drugs, I can change your life. So make a long story short, from 2000 to 2004, Wilson said, be the Greens. You know, I'm like, Greens is like, this is a whole new movement, understand it, you ain't gonna have to deal with all the other stuff. So to make a long story short, in 2004, Chauncey Bailey, he was a newspaper article writer, bless his soul, he was one of my mentors. So to make a long story short, I had a lot of ins, ins and outs in the city. Soon I ran for mayor, they pulled guns on me. They said, I kill you because I don't want you to split, split the black votes between Ron Dillips and De La Fuente. So I understood through my personal experience on how education system works and when it comes to the political side. So to make a long story short, you know, I'm from the streets. I'm like, well, let me meet Ron Dillips myself. You know, I got to let him know, hey man, you know, I'm getting these threats. So to make a long story short, I meet Ron Dillums. It was on in West Oakland. It was his mother's birthday. It was on 18th Street. So I meet Ron Dillums. He said, yeah, man, I'm Mr. Ron Dillums. I'm from 13th and Wool Street. Yeah, man, I heard a lot about you, yada, yada, yada. This is how the system works. Da, 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 da. What you want to do? I said, well, man, since I don't have no choice, let me work on your campaign and write policies against the police department. So during that time, I was selected out of 400 some people, he made a group of 800 people to be on his team and broke it down to 40 groups. So I understood how the policies work with the Oscar grants because I was part of the commission. So to make a long story short from that, I understood that when it came to racism and how the system work with our own people is to a higher level. So make a long story short again, I ran for mayor of Oakland again in 2010. The platform was creating a city ID, local currency card. I, understood, I had a, a lot of backdoor deals. People was offering me money, houses, and all these things. Come join the Democrats and a lot of other stuff. I was like, no, nah, I don't want it. I became Don McClay campaign manager. We was the first uh, campaign group to ever do 35 official community events outside other events. From there, supported Jean Kwan. She helped pass the ID local currency. That's what I was known for. But to sum it up, I want to send salute to your dog Vicente in the back. So after the election was over, once we started the Oakland Greens, we had to understand how can we really get on the ground and really do some work. We have a lot of groups. So to make a long story short, me, Vicente, Don, Torger, and his dog, we hit, we put over 20, 15 to 20,000 voter guys hand. But the experience that we went through, Vicente got a gun pulled on him. A man said me and Don did some other stuff. The dog was so tired, he was just asleep. We had to give him some water. Just but, passed out. Yeah. So 
So to make a long story short, after all these years, we worked with candidates, helped them develop candidates. So doing our expertise and experience, that's why I'm so passionate about the Greens. It's a lifestyle for me through my experience. Most people was mad because I didn't do it for money. Y'all Greens, y'all don't got no money. You don't do this. Hey, it'll get there. Take $99, you get 100 people, you're going to be all right. But we understood the system. So we working on everything for finance and uh hey, we're going to have a good 2022 for real. And, you know, the reason that was because we weren't actually even asking for money ever yeah. until until very recent, until uh, actually it would be 2019. Yes, yes. Would have been when, we, when I started making, and we as the Oakland Green started making a concerted effort to do events that were donation-based, because no one's ever turned away for lack of funds, but actually trying to plug away, and you've heard me use it, a corrupt, capitalist system we're just trying to navigate it but yeah we started uh raising money we're not i mean compared to what we were doing we do really really well um we are able to like zoom account over here i'm not paying for that that comes from donation money that we pay for uh when we do our live movie events the food again comes from donations that we pay to the equipment of course is donated um but i don't even when we do our live movie nights i don't i don't put in my labor, my brother's labor, or the equipment in the equation of how well we do uh, donations. Because right now, uh, we started in this, now will be our first live event, of course, after the pandemic, but we were self-sustainable within like a year, where yeah. that the money that we paid for food is definitely what we were making back. And then it could go into the account. And now it's even better where I'm actually, I put out fundraising letters. Uh, we're going out and looking again. We did the event with Rosa Clemente. And even though it was, no one turned away lack of funds, but we sold tickets and we're trying to find that. We do Tracy Rosenberg, we're doing over our local community radio in October, right? So we made sure to do at least one big event with a big name. And we do all these other events trying to raise money for that. Now we're also doing, this is a plug for our donations. We're trying to raise money for a new computer. Right now we're just using mine. And so it's getting kind of full because along with my all of my own personal stuff, we have all the Greens archives and things on it. Um, and we're holding steady that we've raised half of the money for that. Our general fund just got another donation and things too. So um, we just were never asking it. And I finally, I always remember that I have to take notes because I forget even back before. So when we talk about education systems, we want to ask the youth and uh, the parents what they want in their community. Because I also, and I will all agree here, every neighborhood is different, right? So you have to, so you really do want to give them their own bubble. And what does it need for here? Because what's gonna happen at Parker doesn't necessarily uh, need to be happening at Manzanita um, or any things of that nature. So asking them and an, ex an uh, example of that is my kids were and i'm trying to get them teach them like civics like how to be involved in the uh become producers of the politics in their community and not just consumers of it and so because their first thing is like oh well, we don't want any more homework i'm like well that's kind of a harder sell to the school board i was like you could probably do it but just realize you're not gonna have less work. It just means you're gonna to have to do it all in school. I was like, let's start out with something more easy. It's like, what about something for lunch? Is there something that you would like to have at lunch more than once a week? And they all went hamburgers, right? And I was like, oh, if we used to actually had a cafeteria, we could cook the meat. But uh, anyway, but it's like, oh, well that is definitely doable. So you get them, they're making posters and they're picketing at recess and stuff going, you know, hamburgers twice a week, hamburgers twice a week, you know, and getting Miss David, like, okay, well, we'll just put hamburgers on the menu twice a week. Man, look, y'all did that. I, I kind of, you know, nudged you, you all did it. You went around to all classrooms on recess, you're asking people to sign. I mean, also, full caveat, it's kind of an easy sell. <laughs> like who doesn't just like you know burgers by this week but it was good so asking them to do that oh and i personally don't use the word i don't know i think it's a, a scam that they i want to know where it first how it took off defund the police that is a horrible label i don't like it i like demilitarize is a big one because i'm like oh well let's just do that because they to me as a veteran all these police officers have shown that they are not responsible and cannot use those toys, right? Cannot use those weapons that they are going with. 
they, they're, they're no good at it, right? They're, they're not using them correctly. Uh, they're, they're aiming at people's faces with your so-called non-lethal weapons where it's still like killing people and giving them brain damage. Um, so there's like millions and millions of dollars that you could take away and refund it to something else, whether it be education or even just more uh, police that can deal with actual like mental health services. Like they don't need to go out on domestic calls so much. The other thing I always wondered too is like why, well, I didn't wonder, I knew why they did it this way. So OPD has this program where they would come into elementary schools and they'd read books to the kids. But they send in the military officers in full uniforms with guns and everything. I was like, oh, because they're trying to teach you this is your fucking role, buddy. Right? You're gonna your your whole role in this world is to be a prisoner for our private prison system, and you're just a commodity, it's just slavery. And that's your role. I'm just, so I used to always they do this. I was like, when they come to question answer, like, well, why do you have to have, and I also full transparency, I will admit that even in elementary school, I think at least once or twice, I was like, why the fuck you got to wear a gun in here <laughs> in front? And my kids knew, because sometimes I would say, it's like, oh, and I'm going to use profanity in this next monologue, because this is how serious I think it is. But that one, I would just blurt it out. So my kids understood. And I'd get like a little side eye from Ms. Davis, but she, you know, she'd let it go. It didn't happen all the time. Um, but it was definitely on purpose. Why do you fucking have to wear a gun in here to read a goddamn fucking Winnie the Pooh book? What? They don't have like a regular khaki OPD uniform that you could wear? It's just, it's just bullshit, right? It's all a fucking scam. So I think that we can definitely take money away from a police and put it back in to education. Because education, I do also believe, and I think the Oakland Greens would agree with this too, um, education is the way to, to solve all of this shit. Right? We could get rid of all of the isms and ills if we educate it out, because we sure as fuck educated it in. Everything we believe and slang words we use, everything is fucking programmed into us. The brain ain't nothing but a computer, and you can make it have whatever you want to. So uh, do we have any, uh, this is actually, I had denied, I thank you Orlando for inviting, and then I will go to Greg too. Uh, we're almost coming uh, to an end too, but I actually didn't expect anyone to be, I thought it was gonna be Dale, Greg and I. Uh, but Greg, go ahead, please. That was your hand up this yeah. time, right? Just a couple of really quick comments. Um, one uh, about about the police that, um, you know, um, when, when I was going to school, there were no police in any schools anywhere. And I don't know what year they started putting police in, but. And I think there's still plenty of schools uh, around the country where there aren't any police. So, you know, we should uh, just get all the police out of the schools. And I mean, that's crazy. And um, the other thing um, you, you mentioned about besides uh, uh, besides the hamburgers, you, you also mentioned about uh, homework and, uh, you know, kids. Try, uh, so the, let's get rid of the homework. Um, if, if you look at educational systems around the world, one of the very top ranked countries is Finland. And in Finland, they either have no homework for the kids or very, very little homework until you're much older. And so, you know, that's another thing that we can look at is what's going on in other places and why, let's learn from these other places that are doing it in, in ways that are much better than here. Right, not be afraid of it. Gabriella, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about that, and I'm glad you brought it up, Greg, about the police uh, in schools, because I forgot to mention it earlier. Because, um, so I was in middle school in the early 80s. And, um, and so there was corporal punishment. Now we know all of us here, we had that, right? <laughs> because when I was in middle school, that ended. That ended. Oh, no, not you? Not in private school, huh? Okay, so- My it, mother would have killed somebody. They put yeah. their fucking hands on me. Right. So, well, yeah, because you had to, your parents had to sign off on it, right? Yeah, your parents had to sign off on it. So what happened was that when I was in middle school, by the time I finished middle school, it would have been around 84, they got rid of it because parents complained that the administrators, you know, uh, were heavy handed, right? Were heavy handed with it. So then they got rid of the corporal punishment. But then all of a sudden, like you said, Greg, when the heck did they decide that police police officers was a good a good decision? You know, so a good pathway, because um, 
the other thing that I found out, not only not only that police are on campus, Greg, but like, for example, because I'm from Southern California, uh, I'm near Palm Springs. So they have, they have um, in San Bernardino, which is near here, about a couple hours away, in Los Angeles, um, I think even Riverside, um, there's actual police departments, like the district, the school district has police departments I'm like what the heck w where did this get passed yeah i have no idea actually but can i ask how did you hear about this event if you're in southern california um i i was invited i we came through my email oh you're on, on a list nice nice yep no i have green list okay cool now that's great yeah, i'm glad that's like this is like the third one that i've been to third or fourth Oh, wow. Okay. Well, some of the more crowded ones. As we get back to uh, people getting out now that, you know, the pandemic is at least in our area too, because we get vaccinated, um, started to. Also, there's a Julian Assange event that was happening at the same time. There's also a Palestinian uh, protest in San Francisco that's happening. There's a whole bunch of other stuff happening on this, but, you know, you scheduled the last Sunday, got to stick to our schedule as well. Um, so, but I, I think this has been actually super incredible. I'm glad that we were able to get our idea and policy out. Does anyone have anything else to add before we uh, close out? No, thank you. Well, for the seven people who will be watching this on YouTube, again, my name is Vicente Cruz. I'm the event fundraising coordinator and also the treasurer for Oakland Greens. And uh, we hope to see you uh, next month for our other second annual uh, linguistics town hall on race, gender, and ethnicity. Uh, we also will deep dive into some of these things, like I said, uh, defund the police versus demilitarize or refund the police versus defund and all those labels, you know, how does that affect uh, what we do and how we see. So thank you very much. And uh, if you need to, let me also plug oaklandgreens.org and also our Facebook group or Instagram is popular as well. Um, and we have good engagements with uh, Greens around the world and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month and at the second weekend that we have the county uh, Green Party, uh, Green Sunday and then Green Meetings. Um, KPFA local station board elections are going on. Please, uh, you have two days to uh, get your $25 in to either run or nominate candidates. And then uh, third weekend is the Oakland Greens public monthly meeting where we do talk about all of our, our general business. You can see what we're doing fundraising wise. And then of course, the last Sundays of the month are always our virtual town halls until we get back to in-person. So thanks everyone for coming. Everyone have a great evening. Bye, everybody.